Very good morning. You're very welcome to Kingfisher Church, Little Paxton, and our family morning service. My name is Andrew Barr. I'm a member here, as I'm sure most of you know. But if you're new or your memory's as poor as mine, I thought I might just say that. Let me just go through what we're going to do this morning. We're going to bring our thanks and praise to the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're going to talk to God in prayer at various times, and that's not idle chatter. We're going to pray in accordance with God's will and his promises. And we're also going to listen to God as he speaks through his word. Um, I'm going to leave the first half of this service, and then... Our pastor, Rich Fairburn, will come to preach on Genesis 18, verses 16 through to 33, to teach and explain it to us. The children, that's reception up to year six. I think that's right. I'm trying to convert in from old to new money. But that um, they've got groups, and when we finish the final verse, I'll let you know they'll go out into their groups. There is a creche as well. This is a family service. We have children, so there might be some noise. And that's, you know, we're quite used to that. So please don't feel too uncomfortable, particularly parents of children who might be making, being a little bit restless. If you really are concerned, really, that you can go out through those brown doors there and um, take them there, but feel under absolutely no pressure. One or two practical things, the loos, they indeed are through those um, double brown doors as you came through the first. That'll be on the left for most of you, apart from people who are sitting the extreme right of me. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all um, I need to say in terms of the practical things. So why don't I pray as we begin our time together to bring our thanks and praise to our Heavenly Father. So let me pray. You are worthy of all honor and praise. And we pray now that all that we do, sing, everything about this meeting brings honor and glory to your name. And we pray this through your son's precious name. Amen. Why don't we begin by reading together Psalm 145, 145. If you'd like to uh, follow me, I'll, I'll get things started, but join in as soon as you can. All right, so let's say Psalm 145 together. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Amen. So let's continue in our thanks and praise to our Heavenly Father by singing all creatures of our God and King. So when the musicians begin to play, if you'd like to stand. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and we'll go sing. Oh, praise you. Hallelujah. The morning sun will go to
Of a weekly notices, I um, don't uh, intend to prove them all. What I would suggest, if you are new or relatively new and you haven't already, get in touch with our church administrator, Diana Bass, and um, I'm sure if you're sitting someone near who you think attends Kingfisher Church at Little Paxton, then ask them to point you in the right direction or to one of our leaders. Just one thing I did want to mention it's tea time church, isn't it? Thank goodness. Uh, not thank goodness. It'd be very good. I bet I got it right. Um, so that is, we're meeting at 4.30. I, we came, my wife and I, at 4 o'clock last time. Um, 4.30. It's a, an all-in service, if you like. Um, a little bit more informal tables and chairs. Sit around. Be some crafts. There'll be a talk, which Paul... Paul Dutton, a recent pastor, will leave. Uh, and um, there will also be some tea as well. So if you're able to, that would be great. Also, one other thing. We are shooting through May. And 2nd of July, we have got our family away day, church away day. That sounds like a rail ticket, doesn't it, family away day? But anyway, um, we, that's at the hub at Gambling Gay. As I say, 2nd of July, so, um, you know, keep that in your diary. As I say, it's, we're all, we're getting through um, May pretty quickly, so that will be upon us soon. Um, I don't believe there's anything else I need to mention. So what we're going to do next, we are going to sing God Our Father, full of power. And this is essentially is, a, is the creed. And a creed is basically a statement we all make corporately as the church of those key beliefs. Um, and Christians have been saying a creed of one point or another probably since for 400 AD, AD for, you know, bef um, after Christ's birth. So, and they are important. They are the key beliefs we have as Christians. So we can either say them or sing them. We're going to sing it now. So again, when musicians begin to play, why don't we stay and sing God our Father full of power.
Have a look at these words on the screen. I'll read them out to you. It's 1 John, verses 8 to 9. Claim about sin, we deceive. Give us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Why don't we use those words to meditate upon them and in the quiet of your own heart, confess your sins if that's appropriate for you, to our Heavenly Father. We'll just have a few moments in silence and pray afterwards. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and make us as, making us heirs of eternal life. In your Son, Jesus Christ, has freed us from our sins by his blood. Yet we still fail to love you with all our heart or serve you as we ought. Forgive us, we pray, and cleanse us so that we may continue as members of Christ in whom alone is salvation. Amen. We are going to sing Grace Awaiting You. And we know that if we are in Christ, we have put our trust in Him. Our sins have been dealt with. And we can come and confess our sins. We can be forgiven. And this song will remind us of this. So again, when musicians begin to play, if you'd like to stand. see the world to come for one has suffered in my place now there is grace awaiting me awaiting me judgment's done and it's almost made the ransom's paid no guilt remains now there is grace awaiting me awaiting Welcome from the Father. Grace, forgiveness, full and free. Grace that's greater than our failings. Oh, there is grace awaiting. I 
We're going to pray now, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the world, for the people in it, all made in your image. And as we see the continuing war in Ukraine, almost three months now, we do pray for that nation and for its people. We pray for Russia, its leaders, and the countries surrounding it. We do pray for President Putin, for President Biden, President Zelensky, and Western leaders. We do pray that efforts for peace may come to fruition. We pray for those who have fled Ukraine, refugees. Pray that they are able to settle into the countries they have fled to, including the United Kingdom. We pray that uh, they're able to find a welcome. They're also able to access all the necessary services they are able to. Well, Lord, as we think of peace, we know that the only true peace comes in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And we know that he will return again and he will establish that new heaven and new earth when there will be no tears, no sin, no hurting, no sickness. And we also know that because you are a God of love, Father, you're also a God of justice, and we are confident that those who perpetrate such evil will 
if they are not reconciled to you through your son, will face your true justice. And as we say that, we recognize our own hearts of darkness too. Lord, we pray this morning too for the prison ministry, which uh, occurs at Little Hay Prison locally, and the team which go into Little Hay Prison. We do give thanks for their faithful service and continued witness to your gospel of grace for those who are in prison for whatever their offense. We pray for that partnership in the gospel between St. Neot's Evangelical Church, for Kingfisher Church, Little Paxton, and for the other churches um, who go into the prison. And particularly we pray now as um, in-person visits by the prison ministry team are going to be a, become a reality. There are all the various forms um, and paperwork which will take place, which will have to take place to get back in to make these prison visits and services at the chapel. So we pray that that may um, occur without too many issues or problems. We do give thanks to Dan and John, for Ben, and for the particularly those we know at St. Neer, that of Evangelical Church, um, as part of that ministry team. And we pray that others might seek to become part of this prison, prison ministry team as well, Lord. And we also pray for the chaplain at Little Hay, or one of the chaplains, Dave Kinder, who will be leaving and will be replaced by someone else. And again, we pray that uh, the, the chaplain there will be gospel-hearted servant and again, will preach that good news within the constraints of prison and the prison service uh, that is allowed. We also pray for Kingfisher Church, for its life, the rhythms of life and its witness. And as it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 to 7, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing in thankfulness. And as our church covenant, covenant states, we will be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So help us to be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ and continue to live our lives strengthened in the faith as Kingfisher Church here in Paxton. And finally, Lord, we bring to you those we know who are not well, struggling in whatever way, the ravages of old age, just finding life very difficult. You have called us to cast all our burdens and anxieties upon your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray now for those, or even for ourselves, who are finding life difficult, ill health, whatever it might be, that we might be strengthened in the knowledge that the Lord Jesus loves and cares for us. And might we know his ever-present uh, <clears throat> presence around us and his tender, loving arms of mercy. And we pray all of these things in the name of our Son, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yvonne is going to come and read the Bible now. Um, it's Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. There are Bibles at the back if you'd like one. So Genesis 18, verses 16 to 33. And it's headed, Abraham pleads for Sodom. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham 
what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great that their, and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know it. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there, there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare a place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked. Treating the righteous and the wicked alike, far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 people there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? He said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? He said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only ten can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Then the Lord, when the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. Thank you, everyone. We're going to sing once more. In the final verse, if the children go out into their groups, then Rich Fairburn is going to come and preach from the passage that Yvonne kindly read to us. So when musicians begin to play, if you'd like to stand. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your own.
you take a seat. Good morning. Uh, Let's pray, shall we, as we come to God's word. Our God in heaven, we ask as we have sung that you would speak to us and that as we hear your word, that in your grace we call upon you uh, to provide grace for us this morning, that by grace we might stand by faith upon your promises and we might walk by faith all the days you've given us on earth as we head towards our beloved Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now. Help us to give attention to your word and by your spirit producing us a right response we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. The world is admirably arranged. Maybe. Maybe it is. And that's what uh, W.H. Auden poem said. He said this. He said, I like committing crimes. God likes forgiving them. Really, the world is admirably arranged. Do you get that? You you hear what he's saying? He's saying, I like to sin, and God likes to forgive, so we match each other. We fit well together, don't we? Everything has its place. I wonder if we ever find ourselves thinking like that, thinking basically we can do as we want. It doesn't really matter because God's just going to come and clear the mess up afterwards. Who is God? Who is God? We we don't come together on a Sunday to be entertained with notions and ideas. We don't don't come together so we can, I don't know, kind of flounder about in in the abyss of some sort. We, we, We come to be confronted with the overwhelming reality of God. Who is God? Atoza said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. I wonder if we get that. Uh, As we come back to Genesis, Genesis begins, in the beginning, God. Immediately, as we open our Bibles and we come to the very first sentence, we are confronted with the otherness of God. God is not a part of creation. He's not like anything else. God is is incomparable in his majesty. I I, I don't know about you, but I I struggle with that. I I really struggle to to, to grapple with the immensity of God. He is beyond my comprehension. Again, Tozer said this. He said, all the problems of heaven and earth, all the problems of heaven and earth, though they were to confront us together and at once, would be nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God, that he is what he is like and what we as moral beings must do about him. What is God like? Who is God? Uh, The book of Genesis begins with the power of God, producing everything, speaking it into existence, and then surveying the whole of creation and saying, it is very good. See, Genesis is introducing us to God who is holy. He's other. He's not like anything else. He's he's completely different, and the world he makes shows what he is like in his power and in his goodness. The world is good because God made it, and God is good. The creation comes from God, spotless, without blemish, because that's what God is like. The original paradise was good, because God is good. Well, this morning we come, as we journey through Genesis, to chapter 18, verses 16 to 33. At the beginning of this chapter, as we saw last week, introduces us to a divine encounter. Verse 1 of the chapter says, the Lord appeared to Abraham. 
And it's shrouded in mystery because the way the Lord appears is by three men arriving at Abraham's tent. And he welcomes them and he feeds them. And we saw last time that the Lord promises Sarah a son. A promise that would have sounded cruel to Sarah. So she heard it in a cruel way because it was a promise so good and so impossible. But the Lord challenges her doubting heart. And he asked last time to challenge her doubt. He asked her, is anything too hard for the Lord? Saying, when you've looked at the impossibility of the promise, have you looked at everything to do with the promise? Have you, have you considered the one who makes the promise? Or have your thoughts about God become too small and too restricted, too crowded out by your own limitations? Who is God? Our, our passage continues. With that, really, is the great question underneath. Who is God? It begins when the meal is over and the men get up to leave. And verse 16 says, they look down towards Sodom. Genesis 18 and 19 will take us through this 24-hour period, focused on the events that happen in Sodom. Now, when we hear about Sodom here, as we've gone through Genesis, we know three things already about this place. Three things about Sodom. First of all, it is a prosperous part of the country. Now, back in, in chapter 13, when Abraham and his nephew Lot had to separate their, their possessions, they had too much livestock for the land to cope, that they went in different directions. And it says that Lot looked towards Sodom, and it was like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. It is a prosperous place. And we also know that it is an outstandingly wicked place. Again, in chapter 13, the narrator tells us the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. It is rich, it is wicked, and it's also known grace. In chapter 14, the king of Sodom starts a war, a war which he loses terribly. He's, he's completely overwhelmed, and the, the winning forces um, go to the city of Sto Sodom, take all the people captive and all the possessions away. Uh, but then in chapter 14, um, Abraham goes to the rescue of Sodom. Um, Abraham rescues the people, he recovers the possessions, he returns it in full, and the king of Sodom comes out to pay him for what he's done. And Abraham says, no, I will take nothing from you. This is the doing of God most high. It's the doing of the creator of heaven and earth. It is a gift. Sodom had known grace. Well, these divine messengers are on their way to this place. And yet before they arrive, we're told of this conversation between the Lord and Abraham. We're going to use two questions to help us navigate through this passage today. The first one is, why does the Lord tell Abraham his plans? Why does the Lord do that? And what is it that the Lord tells him? What does the Lord reveal about himself? And so first of all, why does the Lord reveal his intentions to Abraham? That's what happens, isn't it? This group of three men shrouded in mystery. But it's, no, they're not quite what they seem. Uh, Abraham accompanies them on the first part of their journey. And then verse 17 these three men, then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? The Lord has a plan, a purpose for, for this place of Sodom. And if we've read Genesis carefully, we know already what it is. Uh, again, in chapter 13, as the narrator speaks about Sodom, he says, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what's coming. As readers through Genesis, we know that is coming, but Abraham doesn't know. And the Lord deliberates and decides to reveal to Abraham his plan beforehand. Why does he do that? Well, let's look carefully. Verse 18. Abraham will surely, will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. That's the promise. The great promise that, that drives the whole of history forward. It's the promise uh, which drives the, the, the whole of God's plans and purposes forward. We heard it first in chapter 12. The promise that God made to Abraham. And because God had made the promise, the promise is rock solid certain. Abraham will surely, because it is definitely going to happen. And what's going to happen, the Lord says, is blessing. Blessing will happen. The goodness of creation ruined by sin will be restored by grace. And the scope of the blessing is that all the nations will be included. That's God's promise. His promise is to restore the original blessing, to, to include all the nations in that and to do it through Abraham. 
Now, now we can pick up the promise and trace how it developed on, how it went through history, how it goes right on to the coming of the promised one, how the promise goes to the point where God in flesh appeared among us. And the purpose of the coming of God into flesh was so that the, the, the blessing might be unleashed with such indescribable goodness. Ephesians chapter 1 says this. It says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everything lost in the fall, every ache of brokenness, every stain of sin will be restored and redeemed and, and renewed and recreated and so much more, all in Jesus Christ. And see, after Christ had finished his work of, of doing this, after he finished his work of achieving what is needed for the promise, after his death and resurrection, he sent his disciples with a command and said, go make disciples of all nations. That the blessing is to be unleashed upon the whole world. And then as we read on, the last book of the Bible gives us that glimpse into the world to come, that sneak preview of what is ahead when it says there is a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and shouting out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The certain promise of blessing for all nations. That's verse 18, and then verse 19 takes us further into it. What does he say? For I have chosen him. God has chosen Abraham. Literally, he's known Abraham. Entered into this covenantal relationship with Abraham with a purpose. I have chosen him. Why have you chosen him, Lord? For what? Well, it says, so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Now, keep on track here. Verse 18, the certain promise of grace. Verse 19, the purpose of the promise of grace. The reason that God chose Abraham and made the certain promise is because Abraham will set the direction for the future generations. And the direction is to keep the way of the Lord. That is to walk with the Lord. And what does it look like? Doing what is right and just. Now, in Genesis 18, we're going to see that doing what is right and just is what God does. That's the real weight of the chapter. The conversation that develops um, after this is wrestling with the fact that God does what is right and just. That's what God is like. And in verse 19, he says that's the purpose of the promise, that people will do what is right and just. And I think what's happening is this. What's happening is that in the beginning, in Genesis 1, God created people in his image male and female, humanity blessed in creation with that status of being God's image bearers on earth. But that's the dignity that all humanity has. The dignity we have is we bear the image of God. But like a shattered mirror, the image was broken when people went away from God. When we decided we wouldn't walk with the Lord, the image was broken. And we see it immediately in Genesis as as what follows from that broken image is murder and strife and uh, oppression and injustice. Uh, we see it today, don't we? The image is shattered. But what is the image? What's God like? Well, God always does what is right and just. Abraham's to direct future generations, this community of God's people, to walk with the Lord and do what is right and just. See, this great promise of grace made to Abraham that's going to include all the nations includes the restoration of the image of God in man. That's how verse 19 ends, isn't it? So that, another so that, the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Restoration of the image of God. People who live right and fair is part of the certain blessing of grace. And so, why does God reveal to Abraham what he's going to do? Well, for Abraham and for his descendants to trust the promise of grace, and for Abraham and his descendants to live out the promise of grace and bear the fruit of the promise in how they live, they need to know what God is like. Now, the promise is a promise that which will bring man to God, back to God. A man that was banished from God in Eden will be restored to God through the promise of grace. It brings people to walk with God 
And to walk with God, you need to know what God is like. And so God reveals to Abraham his plan. Because he wants to make himself known so that his people might walk with him. So the question is, who is God? Well, what does he reveal of himself? Second question. What does the Lord reveal? Now, the Lord tells Abraham what he is going to do. And then Abraham responds. And there's a, in prayer, so it's a pleading petition as they go back and forth. And, and as this happens, uh, there are a couple of things that we learn about what the Lord is like. Here's the first one. Suffering produced by sin draws the intention and intervention of the Lord. See this in verse 20 and 21. The Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The Lord said, The outcry. We know Sodom in chapter 13 is a place of wickedness and great sin against the Lord. We know Sodom is a place where the vulnerable are oppressed. Ezekiel speaks about what was happening at this time where the strong crush the weak. It's a place where all the ways of God have been turned on their head. They've been put back to front. Everybody sets their own standard and then acts in their own interest at the harm of others. And the outcry, the suffering that that causes is noticed by God. The outcry, it's the same word used of Abel's blood that cries out from the ground after his brother murders him. The effect of sin cries out in agony and cries out for justice. Now we know this outcry, don't we? Now don't we know this? And when we turn on our TVs and we see the dead body of an immigrant child on a beach, what happens in our hearts is this outcry. When we hear of women and children trapped in a city in Ukraine being bombarded by the madness of war and they're starving and they're hopeless, we hear the outcry in our hearts. When a man is murdered by police officers simply for the colour of his skin and cities across the world roar in protest, we are hearing the outcry. And we know this outcry. The suffering caused by the way people treat each other. Suffering caused by the way that whole societies and cultures are constructed. We know this outcry, but we know it as a whisper compared to what God knows. The outcry that reaches God is not confused or muted or partial. God hears the outcry as a roar in perfect detail. The outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah is heard by God and it is so great Literally, it is so many. There's so much to it. It's a cacophony of voices in, in, in disharmony, pouring out, screaming out for justice and for, for, for agony. And the cause of the outcry, the reason the outcry comes is that the sin is so grievous, that, that, the, that the sin is so weighty and so heavy upon this place. And so the Lord's intention, as we will see, is to sweep it away. The Lord's intention is to destroy it all, the city, the sinners, the whole thing. God's intention is to remove such a horror from the face of his earth. Because God hates sin. God hates sin. We have to be careful when we say things like that. God is not like us. His hatred is not like our hatred. Uh, God doesn't hate because he's defensive or threatened or, 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 or because he's, um, he's, somehow his ego is bruised. God's hatred is a settled revulsion of his holiness against everything that destroys and ruins. Now, God's hatred of sin is essential to his godness. Now, God is pure goodness and he hates what will ruin his world. He hates what spoils life. Because people were made in the image of God, made to image God. A lady called Jackie Hill Perry writes, How offended our God must have been when he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah and didn't see himself in how they lived. You know, this suffering produced by sin, it draws the attention and the intervention of the Lord. 
I, I think we can struggle with this. A struggle to see that connection between suffering and sin. It's been there right from the beginning, right from when God said in the garden, if you eat from the forbidden tree, you will die. It's been there right since then, but, but even that feels a bit random, doesn't it? It's just fruit on a tree, God. And in fact, like so much of what God says about how we live, we look at it and we think, well, I, I think I can make a better assessment of that action. Now, that's often what we do, isn't it? We think, well, it's not going to harm anyone, is it? So it can't be so bad. That's how the world around us decides how to live so often, isn't it? That the standard is if it doesn't hurt anyone, it's okay. It's a crazy standard, really, when you think about it. No, to say, if it doesn't hurt anyone, it's okay, presumes that we know everything. If we could see the total impact and outcome of every action, maybe that's a measuring stick we could use. But I don't know about you, but I can't. No, none of us can. Only God can do that. Only God can see everything. And we're called to trust that what he says is best for how we live. And when we deviate from that, it is sin. But I reckon we, we, we maybe struggle at a deeper level with what the Bible says about how God deals with sin. I think our, our, our struggle says so much about what we really think about God. Again, Jackie Hill Perry says this. She says, we have a ridiculously low view of sin and an equally mediocre grasp of the holiness of God. What do you think? Now, what can we do about that? Well, in Genesis 18, in order to trust the promise of grace, in order to live out the promise and bear the fruit of the promise in transformed living, you need to know what God is like. So God reveals something of himself to Abraham. He reveals he is not indifferent to the suffering, that the outcry reaches him and he doesn't turn away, but he acts. And God reveals that he's not indifferent to the way that suffering connects to sin, so he will destroy the root of the problem. He will go right to the core of it, right to the, the fundamental flaw in the, in the heart of man. He will destroy sinners from the face of the world. As we read on through our Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah become a warning to us. We read it through the prophets. And then we get to the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. It says, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes. And made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. The outcry of Sodom reaches the ears of the Lord. And we are to learn that the outcry caused by all the sin in all the world will reach the ears of the Lord. And he will not be indifferent. But he will act. And he will remove all sinners from the face of the earth. And bring them to the judgment of his divine fury. And so Peter adds the warning like this. But he's not slow in keeping his promise. A promise of grace, promise of judgment. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, when we consider God's attitude towards, towards sin, we are to hear a warning. That our sin offends the holiness of God offends it in the deepest dimension and draws to us his righteous anger. And the only reason we are not obliterated immediately by holy fire is because God is patient and he gives us time to repent. What is God like? Well, suffering produced by sin draws the attention and intervention of the Lord. Secondly, the Lord deals in perfect justice and mercy. What is God like? God continues to reveal himself to Abraham. And, and, and then from verse 23, maybe if we're familiar with this passage, we don't quite feel it. But it's, it's staggering what happens here. As Abraham and the Lord go back and forth. The, the Lord has said, I will go down and I will see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. And the door is opened a little chink for Abraham to step into that investigation in prayerful petition. Prayerful petition for the sake of the wicked city. Verse 23, then Abraham approached him and said. What, what, 
What do we make of a, of a prayer like this? It feels like negotiation, doesn't it? Abraham pushes and pushes, the goalpost being shifted and shifted and shifted. Let's um, see three things about it. First of all, in this prayer, Abraham appeals to the character of God. Basically, he, he says to the Lord, what if on, on your investigation in this city, you find there are some righteous people there? No question about the wickedness of the place. No question about the fact that it's right for God to bring judgment. The question is, what if innocent, if innocent people get caught up with the guilty? Is it really okay for there to be that kind of collateral damage? Abraham's pretty incredulous about this as he begins. He says, well, would you really do such a thing, God? In fact, in verse 25, he says twice, far be it from you. And it's a strong expression he makes. He's basically saying it would be abominable for you to do something like this. He pushes into the character of God. He says, for God to kill the righteous with the wicked would be a desecration to his holy justice. And, and he sums it up at the end of verse 25 with the rhetorical question, will not the judge of all the world do right? Now last week we saw the rhetorical question, is anything too hard for the Lord? And we saw nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too hard, but there are some things he cannot do. He cannot do what is wrong. He cannot do anything other than what is perfectly right and fair. Now, do we know that? God cannot do wrong. He cannot do you wrong. Now, God can never act towards you in a way that is not fair. He will always do what is right. We don't always see it. But, we, but God does see it. He sees all things and how all things work together. He sees perfectly and completely and he will never do you any wrong. We see Abraham appealing to the character of God. We see Abraham recognizing his own nature. In verse 27, as Abraham presses on, he, he has a sense that this is crazy talk, really, to talk to God like this, to be in a conversation with the Lord Almighty. So he says, he says, I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. It's not an equal conversation. Abraham knows he is dust. Genesis 2 says we are made from dust. Genesis 3 says because of sin we are returning to dust. And when Abraham says he is ashes, in the context of what is about to happen to Sodom, he puts himself in the same category as the wicked. He is ashes. You see, as Abraham appeals to God's perfect justice, he knows he must draw in the necessity of mercy. Even to make a request like this, he needs mercy. As he goes on, he says to the Lord, may the Lord not be angry. And then he says it again, may the Lord not be angry. Now, why would he say that? Now, Abraham has just laid this foundation that the Lord is perfectly just. If you say to one who is perfectly just, don't be angry with me, you are only asking for mercy. Perfect justice is only angry when it is deserved. Abraham knows his character, knows his own nature, and he appeals for mercy. He says to the Lord, Lord, if there were 50 righteous in the city, would you spare it? What does that mean? Literally, he says, would, would you lift concerning it? The, the Lord's about to put his punishment on the city, and that's what Abraham's referring to. He's saying, would you, would you lift that away? Lift away the punishment the city deserves for the sake of these righteous. If you've got an NIV, the footnote um, referring to the Greek translation uses the word forgive. That's what Abraham's asking. Would you forgive them? W would you forgive the wicked city? And the Lord said, yes. And Abraham pushes it. But what if it was 45, Lord? Or what if it was 40? Or 30? Or 20? Or 10? And the Lord agrees. For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. How does that sit with us? No, the, the, the conclusion of this prayer, for the sake of 10 righteous, I will not destroy the city of the wicked. Abraham's argument is basically saying, he's saying, he's saying, justice is not justice if the means are not just. 
Justice is not justice if the means are not just. It's like when, um, when, when a teacher punishes a whole class and that they all have to miss their playtime because one or two children are playing up. That there is justice in punishing the naughty, but if it includes everyone else, it's not fair and we complain. Well, children complain anyway. If punishing the wicked harms the righteous, it's not justice. So there's this tension that is wound up in the prayer. He's appealing for mercy on the basis of justice. He's saying, forgive the wicked city so you don't risk acting unjustly. And astonishingly, the Lord agrees. And what is God like? He is perfectly just. He will never do anything wrong. So when sin happens, it must be punished. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sodom stands as a warning to us, a warning to all generations. It's a, it's a kind of the world in miniature. It's a microcosm of cosmic justice, a justice that will come more certainly than night follows day. And God is merciful. And he'll forgive the wicked for the sake of the righteous. But if he does that, if the Lord forgives the wicked, how can he still be doing what is right? If he lets the wicked off the hook, where's the justice? And if there is no justice, well, Abraham's just said, if there is no justice, God would be desecrating himself. If there is no justice, God would no longer be God. And if God's not God, then, well, there's nothing, is there? What is God like? Now, Abraham knew already. Back in chapter 15, the Lord showed him in a vision. He was shown that God is so committed to bring about his blessing of grace that God himself would walk alone the bloodied path of judgment. Now, Abraham was shown a picture of what must come. Abraham was shown that we worship the God of the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is the place where the judge of all the world does what is right. In this chapter, Abraham pleads with the Lord. He says, will you not extend mercy to the many for the sake of the few? Well, God shows his deep commitment both to justice and mercy so that ultimately he will extend his mercy to the many for the sake of the one. And it will be justice. It will be justice because that one would carry the guilt of the many onto himself. The only one who has no guilt of his own. And so Jesus Christ died as a punishment-bearing sacrifice. And Romans 3 says he dies to demonstrate the justice of God. He had no sin of his own, but he took our sin upon himself. And with taking our sin, he drank the cup of holy wrath down to the dregs. In that cup, concentrated into that cup were those hours of infinite displeasure of total abandonment, incomprehensible suffering, the full force of holy indignation that crushed his soul as Christ became Sodom for us. The judge of all the world did justice because sin was met exactly with eternal condemnation. And the judge of all the world did mercy because the judge took the condemnation on himself, lifted it from the wicked, so that all who repent and call upon his name, call upon his name for the forgiveness of sins, will receive it in full. So what does that mean for us? Who is God? Two things. First of all, first of all, we can be included in the promise through Jesus Christ. Now, verse 18 says, the blessing is for all the nations on earth. If you are included in all the nations on earth, then this promise is offered to you. The disciples were sent to go and preach the promise to all the nations on earth. All people are offered the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. You are offered the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. It is put before you and it is yours to refuse. And the promise is eternal blessing. And all of us, every single one of us, deserves the exact opposite. Without exception, yet we receive, we are offered what, what we don't deserve. Because God is patient. He's giving us time, every one of us, he's giving us time to repent. But to trust the promise, we need to know what God is like. 
that, that he's the creator, that he is perfectly holy, that sin, all sin is an offense to him, and he will judge the world perfectly, and the only escape from the wrath of God is when we take refuge in the Son of God, in Jesus Christ. We are included in the promise of grace. So are you in Jesus Christ? Nothing else really matters, does it? Are you in Jesus Christ? And secondly, the promise includes transformation. And the God created people in his image. The city of Sodom epitomized the destruction of that image. But God's redemptive purposes is to recreate the image in man. And Sodom stands as a warning to spur us away from the deceptive idea that sin has no consequence. But it shows us sin is opposed to the whole goodness of God. Sodom reveals the character of God in his justice and in his mercy. You are given dignity because God created you in his image. And we spoil the image because of our sin, but God's grace abounds even more and his redemptive purpose is to restore the image. So Colossians 3 says, get rid of all your sinning. Turn away from it because you've taken that off with your old self and its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the image of its creator. And how does the transformation happen? Well, in Genesis 18, God reveals his nature to Abraham so that the coming generations of his people might have the image of God renewed in them. Now, the means of transformation is look, we look at God we see what God is like. And to live out the promise of grace and bear its fruit, we need to know what he's like. And then by the Spirit, we, we, we grow. We, we grow in our concern for suffering. We, we grow to, to tune our ears to hear the outcry of, of the struggle in the world. And we move toward the needy because that's what God is like. And we are being recreated in his image. The one whose image is restored in us. And by the Spirit, we're to have a deep concern for justice. Justice, well, justice in the world to come is to matter to us because that's what God is like. And by the Spirit, we are to love mercy. We are to love mercy, show mercy, receive mercy, live in mercy because that's what God is like. So if we are to walk with the Lord, we must wrestle with the immensity of his holy justice and his deep mercy and we see those things most clearly in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Who is God? What is it that comes to our minds when we think about God? That is the most important thing about us. What comes to your mind? Let's have a minute to think on that and then we'll pray. O oh God of mighty and perfect justice, God of deep and tender mercy, please would you set before us the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we see there your justice and your mercy meeting together and your grace poured out to us. Amen. Oh, we're going to sing as we conclude our time together. We're going to sing about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ where justice and where mercy meets in perfection. And the musicians are ready. Let's stand and sing together.
Please do stick around for refreshments. We're back here at 4.30 for Tea Time Church. It'll be lovely to see you then. Uh, but now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.